Variables are containers for values. We can call them by their name and then use them in Power Automate Desktop Flows. Here you will have the variables that we'll use the most. The first one that is text. That could be any kind of text from email addresses to the content of a Word file. So for example, let me move to my desktop here. I have an empty folder called project. This is where my entire project later on will go in. Excel files, documents, everything. Let's grab the path of this. So I say shift right click. Then I can find this copy as path here. I need to press shift in while I right click with the mouse. Otherwise, this will not get shown. I click here and I go back here. Now I create a variable that will store this project path. So I'll find a set variable like this and drag it in here. These blue things, those are just comments I made to help you so you can actually uh, see how we differentiate the different kinds of variables. First off, we need to give the variable a name. The default name is new var. And look what happened when I press here. You can see that we have percentage signs in the start and in the end. That's the sign of a variable. So whenever we want to refer to this variable, we not only need to type in the name, but we also need a percentage sign in the start and in the end. So new var, that is not re really describing for what we're doing. So we always want to rename our variables so it describes what we want to do with them. For example, this one will be project path. And now I didn't leave the per percentage sign and wrote uh, project path. And when I click away, they disappear. But when I click back, you can see them again. Power Automate Desktop automatically made these percentage sign because let me delete everything and I just say project path again, go back and these will automatically be made. So now I can refer to this variable by its name. I can use it later on in flows. So if I go down here to value, press control V, delete the two quotation marks like this. Now I can refer to this project folder in my entire process. That is very clever and is the best practice that we often use because these paths can change. I can move the project folder and then I just need to change the value of this variable for once. Imagine that I will use it like five times uh, during the flow. I can only, I can just use it here and then just refer to this variable name. So that is very easy to understand. This is also the most common ones. We'll use text a lot. Then we'll have a numerical. Those are numbers. And when we want to do mathematically operations, then we want to use a number. A number looks like this. We will initialize it with another set variable. So if I drag this one in here, let's say that this should symbolize the VAT. So if I say, I can say VAT like this. And again, click back, you can see we automatically get these percentage signs. So you don't need to write them. Then we'll give it a value. In Denmark, it's 0 0.25. And then I can click Save. So now we have a VAT. Let's uh, do a calculation. And here I want to introduce a, an action called Display Message. If I drag this one in here, then uh, there's a lot of parameters to fill in. I will just fill in the message to display. A Display Message action is exactly what it is. It will display a message to the user and the robot will pause until the user has clicked OK. Let me show you. So for example, here we can say the price of the uh, product is 122 plus that. So the that will just be a text here because I haven't used these percentage signs in the start and in the end. So those one will just be letters. Let me show you. So when I click save here, I can now click run. You'll see that here it says the price of the product is 122 plus that. But we actually wanted to uh, do a calculation. We want to add these 25% to it and we can do this. So when I go uh, inside the display message, I can double click to edit it. And now if I want to do a calculation, then I need to have percentage signs in the start and the end also around the numbers. So it will look like this. So it says 122 plus that 
but when we have uh, the VAT was 0 0.25, so we just need to say, and let me just say a parenthesis, then I want to say 1 plus VAT, and then the parenthesis end. Because then this will be 1.25, and then I want to, instead of the addition, I will have a uh, multiply 122, we'll find a total pr price including VAT. It's worth to mention that I only need percent signs in the start and in the end when I'm calculating something with a variable. So I'm using the variable here and you can see we don't have percent signs uh, here and here, but we have them here and here. So only in the start and the end uh, on the entire expression. So now I can click save and we can try to run the robot. So here you can say now the price of the product is 152.5. That is, we now made the entire calculation. I can click OK. Then let's move on. So because we don't want the, this display message to show up in during the rest of these, uh, this exercise, I will right click here and then you can see disable action. It's, it gets grayed out. You won't see it. So we don't have this uh, little bit annoyed, annoying uh, pop up um, in front when the robot runs. Now let's move to a Boolean. A Boolean can only hold two values. It can either hold true or false. That's it. We use it a lot when we want to do checks. Let me show you. Again, we will initialize a Boolean variable. So I'll find a set variable. Then I drag it down here. Let's say that I want to find out whether or not this is a rainy day. So this is a fact. I will say amount of rain. This could come from a website or anywhere else where we have weather forecasts. So the amount of rain, let's say it's five millimeters today. I'm not sure if that is a lot. I don't think that's a whole lot, but it's still rain. So now we set it. And I can initialize another variable called rainy day. So this one will be called rainy day. And this will have the value false. So this is a Boolean I'm introducing here. So I'll say true or false. You'll see it in a second. Now, if I run this, these will just be set and nothing will really happen. But we can actually do something about it. Let's say I want to change the, the rainy day value down here. So I move in here and let's say I want to make it uh, dependent of the amount of rain. So here I'll say if it is a rainy day, that is if this one up here is above 15. So here I'll say amount of rain. And again, I could uh, write these things out. But the great way to refer to these things up here is to click this X here. And then I'll say amount of rain. Now it comes in automatically. I don't risk uh, of typing wrong things in. So now I have the amount of rain. Again, when we make a, an expression, we just need to have a quotation, uh, sorry, percent signs in the start and in the end. So I move in here and I can make spaces in here that uh, that will just be ignored. It will be a little bit easier for you to look at. But then I will say if the amount of rain is uh, bigger than 15, we said. And so this what happens here is this will evaluate on this value. So if this amount of rain is larger than 15, then this will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. Let me just do this. Let me run the robot again. Nothing really happens, but we can see it over here if we want to inspect our variables. So this is a nice place to be. You might not see it and uh, it will look like this. You just have to click this X up here. Now I can inspect the variables and their values for the last run of the robot. If I click in here, you can see we have a Boolean value called rainy day and it's false. And that makes a lot of sense. Because we, we said that um, we want to evaluate if the amount of rain was larger than 15, then we wanted it to be true. But now it's only five, so it's definitely not true. But we can try to change the value up here. So I'll say 20. Now run the robot again. And now you'll see the rainy day Boolean variable, I can double click it over here, is now true. So um, these are checks that we want to do often. So Booleans cannot be ignored. Um, and just remember, they can only be true or false, so they are quite easy to understand. Now let's move on. 
um, a date, uh, a date time uh, in Power Automate for desktop comes in a standard format, and that is month forward slash days forward slash uh, years hours minutes seconds. Let me show you. So if I find a get current date and time like this, and I drag it in here. So here I want to say I want to get the current date and time. And I want to output it into the current date and time variable. So we haven't uh, talked about variables produced, but each of these uh, flow um, actions over here to the left, they almost all of them produce a variable. This one will just give us the current date and time. So when I click save, you can see our action down here. And if I run it, you'll see over here to the right, if I double click here, you can see that this is the current date and time. That is the 5th of October 2022, one, 10 minutes uh, past one, and we can even have um, some seconds on. So this is the default, but we can actually, what, what lies behind here, we can also get milliseconds and everything on, we can do a lot of conversions. So if I just do this, and we will use date and time a lot, Imagine that we want to create a log or we want to dynamically name files so they get a timestamp on whenever we receive them or whenever they get created, we will use a date time. But we might not use want to use, let me again open it, this format because this looks weird and we cannot use all these colons and forward slashes in when we want to do timestamps on a file. So we want to convert it. And what we can do here is that we can go up to actions and then find a convert date time to text and drag this in here. So here you'll say date time to convert. I want to choose the current date and time. So I click this little X here and I take current date and time. The format to use, well, we can use standard. And here you can pick uh, between a lot of formats. So for example, I can pick long time. This only give, gives me the time and it will save it to a variable called formatted date and time. I can click save. Let's try to run the flow again. And again, the values only exist for in the memory of the robot, we haven't printed anything out. And that's really, that's not really the point of this lesson. But let me move uh, inside. Uh, first of all, we have the Q and date and time. Uh, this one, the Q and date time, this will looks exactly like before, except that it's now a little bit later. And the format of date time, if I double click here, now you can see that this is a text value and we only have the time here. Similarly, if we wanted other types of output, if we wanted to use this time date time, we can uh, we can use uh, in the convert date time to text, we can just pick another one from, for example, short date, we can pick a full date time that looks like the with the date in a text format like Tuesday, or we can actually do custom say I want to use it in a file format, I'll often go with this, the year first, then the month, the days, the hours, the minutes and the seconds. So this will be a nice timestamp because this will be unique down to the second. You can also get millisecond, but that's not really the point here. Let me just click cancel and just stay with long time. We will not use that anymore. So lists and list, a list is a collection of items. That is, for example, a list of text values, a list of numeric values, booleans, etc. Let's create a list of um, text values that could be animals. We can, um, we can set a list in a lot of ways. We can either do it manually with a set variable, or we can actually, if I go up to here to variables, we can see that we have a lot of um, list actions here. We can create a new list and then we can add items to it. Usually, uh, we will uh, not go with these actions. Uh, and we will just create them with a set variable that is easy, easier and more flexible. With this add item to list, I can only add one item to the list at once. But I often want to add like five items, 10 items at once, I don't really want to drag five of them in. So it's very, very easy. So I'll find a set variable here. And now we will make a list. Let's just call this list animals. And then to initialize a list variable that will I'll need to have percentage signs in the start and in the end. And then I just need to have a hard bracket in the start and in the end. 
and then my list items will go inside these hard brackets. And these needs to be comma separated. For example, um, I want a, a cat and these ones text values needs to be in single quotation marks. So that will look like this. If I didn't have these single quotation marks on, a power automate for a desktop will think that this cat would be a, a variable because it is inside these percentage sign and then we will have an error because we haven't defined the cat variable. So remember these single quotation marks. And just list, let us just pick a dog, comma separated bird like this. So this is how we initialize a list. And you can see I have uh, spaces in here. It doesn't matter, these will just be ignored, but it might be easier for you to read when you watch this video. If I click save here, I now have a list. Let me just run it again. Um, we have a lot of things that goes on during runtime and then not do anything else. But that's the point of this lesson. We want to see how we can work with variables. If I go over to animals and double click this, you can see that this actually got initialized as a list of text values. We have three items. We have cat, we have dog and bird. Each one of them, they will have um, an index number. And in programming, uh, most of the things are zero indexed. So that means that the cat is uh, placed at index zero and one and two. You just get to uh, to get just get to have your head used to it that the first item is not index one, but index zero, and then you'll be fine. We'll use it a lot, so better remember it. So the first item in a collection in programming is zero. So let's say that we want to refer to the dog in this list. That will be index one. So and let's just have a, another display message here and drag it in. So um, if I just uh, drag this um, this display message in, I can uh, in here I can say animals. So uh, the first one thing I want to do is to refer to the animals, and then I wanted the dog, which was at index one. So I just go uh, say hard brackets, and then uh, I will have the one. I can click save. So now um, I will run it again. And uh, here you can see I got a dog out and I clicked OK. Similarly, if I move in here and I change this one to two, we will have the bird printed out like this. So here we have the bird. So now let's just try to uh, iterate through each one of the values because that is often what we want to do. We have a list and we want to process each, each item in that list. We'll do that with a for each and we'll come to what a for each is. So for now, it's just an iteration of a collection. So here I'll say, what value do I need to iterate? Click this little X here and say animals. We will store it into Q and item. This is just a reference value. So whenever I refer to uh, the Q and item, that is, uh, we run this loop over and over as long as we have items in the list. And wherever we are, that could be we are at the cat, that will be the Q and item, the dog, then will be the Q and item, and then the bird. So, and I often want to rename this to make it uh, a bit of reference so I can say what's going on. And this will actually be a single animal. So the list, that is animals, and each of these items, that is an, an animal. So I can click save. Now let me drag this uh, display message up here. And instead of uh, animals uh, too, I'll just refer to the single animal. So I double click this, and here I can just delete here, and then I'll refer to the animal. I'll click save. Let me try to run it again. So here you can see I have my cat, I have my dog, and I have my bird. That's it. That's how easy it is to use list variables. So uh, again, I'll just right click this display message and just disable the action. So we don't have this pop up going when we move on. So uh, the next thing we want, that is a data table. I haven't made a description for data table here because this data table variable is very, very important and I want to play close, want you to play close attention because we will use it a lot. So let's make the comment together and it will look like the other blue ones, but I just want uh, you to pay very close extent, attention, sorry. That was a, a, a terrible word to say as a non-English being. So we have a data table. 
And a data table uh, looks and acts uh, like an Excel sheet, except it only exists uh, during runtime. And when I say runtime, that is when the robot runs. So whenever we start, the robot and the data table can initialize till the robot has, has uh, ran. Uh, that is where uh, a data table exists. A data table has several key advantages. It's very fast to work in, faster than an Excel sheet. So that's why we want to use it. So it only exists during runtime. And again, it's zero index. It's zero indexed. And uh, again, if you want to refer to the first row in a data table, that will be index zero. Otherwise, no difference. And um, a data table is actually a list of data rows. So, and let me just uh, tell you what's going on here. So when we say it looks and acts like an Excel sheet, that is, we have columns and we have rows. We usually just read our Excel sheet into data tables. We look at the exact same things, except that they only exist when the robot runs. But we'll do that so we can easily do uh, gymnastics with the data. So now that we have the definition in place, we can create a data table. So go up here. We can do it in several ways. And here we can also use a set variable. But I actually like the create new data table action. So drag it in here. So here I can say uh, how many rows and columns do I want? Well, I want three uh, rows and two columns. We already have two columns. And let us just say uh, we want to call this. So I right click here, I can either delete, clear or select. And when I double click, I can rename it. So I want to call this name. And this one, I will want to call it age. And I can just start by um, giving it values here. So say that I want this to be Abraham, and Abraham is 20 years old. I now want another row. So I click this little plus here and I actually want two more rows. So let's just create two of them. Then I want Becky. Becky is 41 years old. And finally, I have Carlo. Carlo is 65 years old. So this is my data table with data. And of course, I could have read this from an Excel sheet. Now I just create it manually. So then I can click Save. Here you can see we produce a, a variable called data tail. Again, let's give, an, uh, let's give it a more describing name. So I'll call this employees and then click save. So now we created a data table called employees. Again, we can refer to, uh, I, uh, to any of the elements in here. And the way we refer to data tables, here we have three, three rows and two columns. That is that we refer to the data table name. Then we say what row we want to, to look in, and then we will say what column we want to look in. Remember again, it's zero indexed. So for example, if we wanted to get Carlos age out or the age that stands here, then we will have to say um, employees, and then we will say 2.1, two that is the coordinates of this one here. Let me show you how that looks. So I just click save here, then I'll find a display message here and just write it out. So here I want to look in the employees data table. I'll find it by clicking this little X here, say employees and go in here. So here I'll say we wanted to have the second row that is the third row, but it's indexed uh, second two. And then I want the second column that is index one. I'll do this. So this is what I'm saying here. Look in the employees data table and then take the second row first column, let me get the content of that cell that was 65. If I remember correctly. Now, if I run the robot again, you'll see that we get uh, 65 out. That was our mission, mission complete. Similarly, we could also uh, iterate through a data table that is in fact, it, well, it could also be an Excel sheet that we read into a data table. So again, I'll find a for each. Let me drag it in after the create new data table. So the value to iterate that will be employees. And here again, I have this little reference variable, I will just call this employee, and then click Save. So now I can refer to this employee, let us just use this display message again. So I'll drag it up here. 
And we just need to fix the expression because now I want to refer to employee. That is the first one. So if I just do employee like this and I could actually delete it, go find it over here so I don't misspell and then I can click save. So when I run this, you'll see that we are uh, saying we get the whole data row out. And that comes back to what we said in the beginning. A data table is a list of data rows. So this is one data row, Abraham 28. The next one comes here and the third one comes here. So but what we want, let's say we just want their, their age out. So uh, I can go in here and then I can say employee and then I need to refer to the column header or index. So for example, if I just do hard brackets and I can say H and do like this and I can click save. Let's run the robot again and um, they will come out here. So that is the first H, the second one and the third one. It's that easy. So that was data table. The final thing that is custom objects. A custom object that is key value pairs. That is, we have a key and then we have a value to that. Think currencies. Um, if we want uh, the key, that will be USD, for example, that will be US dollars. So the key is USD and then the rate that will be in Danish kronos, that will be 750 maybe. So that will be the value. And that has the advantage that we can look things up in a custom object. I can say, give me the USD. I will say, give me the, the value of the key USD. And then Power Automate for desktop will give me the value back. It looks like this. And it's also had the advantage that it's easy to convert to a JSON, if you know that. That's very advanced. We will not touch it here. So I'll find a set variable like this and then I'll drag it in. So we're down here in custom object. I'll call this currency. So then we'll give it a value. So this is the name currency and uh, again, percentage sign in the start and in the end. This time to create a custom object, I need curly brackets. So I'll do this and then I'll have it in here. I'll again, I'll need this to be key value pairs and USD that will go in in single quotation marks in a colon and then it's rate. So 761 times 63. Let's uh, give it that. That was our our first uh, key value pair of currency. Then I can have a comma separate. I can create as many key value pairs as, as I want. Let's just create like three. So I'll say euro colon and then I'll have the euro rate. So uh, 700 and again, these will not be the correct rate, but something similar. And then I will have the Indian rupees. And actually, if you're wondering what base currency it is, it is Danish kronos. I'm from Denmark. So um, then I'll have this colon. And again, I'll have the currency rate here. That will be 9.31 and like this. So now I created this custom object. I can click save. It's down here. And again, let me just disable and I'll actually disable this for each. So we don't have the iteration and I'll do it up here as well. So we only focus on the custom object. Now we created it uh, when we run it. You will see that it exists during runtime. We can go over here, find the currency. You can see we have this custom object and we have the three key value pairs. But uh, say that we want to uh, find uh, whatever the US dollar rate is. So uh, let's have another display message here. So when I want to do a lookup in a custom object, it's very simple. I just go down here, message to display. I'll say currency. Then I just need to give the key and that will be in hard brackets like this. Single quotation marks. I want to find um, the currency rate of US dollar. I click save. Then I can click run. So that one is 761.63. We can see that is right. So then I can click OK. So now we got that one. But let's say we want to do a calculation. Let's uh, finish here. So um, here I want to say, uh, let me give this a message. So I'll want to say one US dollar because this was 100, um, 100, uh, Dan sorry, 100 US dollars cost uh, 700, uh, 100 Danish kronos cost 600, 
100 US dollars costs 661 uh, Danish kroners. So let's find out how much one US dollar cost. You can probably do it uh, very easily, but let's see how we can do a calculation. And I'll just say one US dollar and divided uh, this expression by 100. I can say one US dollar is and do like this. So let us just uh, start the robot again. Here you, go, here you go. One US dollars is 7.6163 Danish kroners. We could, of course, uh, write that as well. We just uh, move uh, outside the expression and put in DKK and then click run. That's it. The next lesson is up here. Just click that one and learn more Power Automate desktop.